an original MCM production. Kent Lovern, Chief Deputy District Attorney, Milwaukee County DA's office, will introduce our program. Thank you, Past President Dan. Uh, Michael Scott is a clinical professor at the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Arizona State University Law School. He is the director of the Center for Problem-Oriented Policing that produces and disseminates information about how police can effectively address specific public safety problems. Mike was formerly a clinical professor in this same role at the University of Wisconsin Law School, and he has also a number of years uh, of service as a law enforcement officer himself, uh, as a patrol officer in Madison, uh, as an assistant to the police commissioner at the NYD, N NYPD, New York City, obviously, assistant to the chief at the St. Louis Police Department, and as a police chief himself down in Florida. Uh, Mike holds a law degree from Harvard and a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin, uh, he has been influential in police departments nationwide and in the development of the community prosecution program here in our own district attorney's office. He uh, was raised in Wisconsin. He's back here this week to discuss local public safety issues and policing in Milwaukee, and we're glad to have him back. Please welcome Mike Scott. Thank you all for the invitation to be here. Uh, what I'm going to present, uh, if you gave me the time, I have taught this variously in one hour, two hours, two days, two weeks, two months. I could do it for two years, and I've been doing it for about 40 years. Uh, I will not keep you that long. I will keep you uh, 20 minutes. You will essentially get the tweet version of everything I've got to say here. Uh, and it's, it's really a story about <clears throat> why we police the way we police and uh, how we need to improve upon that. It is uh, a pretty long story. Uh, many of us, including those of us who became police officers, before we got the job, uh, we formed some ideas about what the police do, what we might do if we, when we were cops. And most of us, if we're honest, we say we'd have to admit we got most of those from Hollywood, from watching television, Adam 12 in my day, NCIS or CSI today. Um, the problem is much of what many of us think about the police, think the police exist to do, and think about how the police ought to do their work is frankly wrong and, and mythical. Well, let me summarize ways in which this is the case. And so this whole idea of problem-oriented policing is built on this recognition that the reality of police work is not the same as what the myth or the image of police work. The image just on the function of the police, what do they exist to do? Uh, we often have the images that it's a fairly simple and straightforward function. They're law enforcement officers. They enforce the criminal law. They fight crime, or something nice to spray paint on the side of a squad car, they protect and serve. Those things are not wrong, but they're not complete. The, the, the function of the police is infinitely more complex. Police have some upwards of eight or 10 different major objectives, things they're trying to achieve, not just one. And the business of policing is much, much more complicated than we imagine. The capacity of the police, uh, how many police we have, how many police we need, how many police are out there at any time, and what authority the police have, we sometimes imagine. In my estimation, the average citizen who doesn't really follow the police closely overestimates the number of police officers in their local police department by a factor of 10. Uh, 
Um, people would be actually rather surprised to realize how few police officers are actually on duty at any one time in their community. Now, to a great extent, police wanted to, didn't want to disabuse anybody of this idea. Better to have people think there were lots and lots of cops out there when the cops really knew there were relatively few. But it's not just the numbers, it's also the authority. We sometimes imagine police have almost unlimited authority. They don't. They are a, it is a powerful institution, but in a democracy, appropriately, there are restraints and constraints on what the police can do. And the limits on those authority are not always apparent to everyone. Right? So it, the capacity is not unlimited, it is limited. Right? The assistance that the police need in order to achieve their mission. Uh, we used to think the police could do it primarily by themselves. That really all they needed the public to do was to pick up the phone and call and report and call the police and the police would take it from there and solve everything. Increasingly we've come to realize that's not the case. The police need a great deal of assistance in order to be effective. Assistance from whom? Well, from the general public, from the, uh, the business communities, from other government agencies. At every turn, police require assistance and cooperation in order to carry out their mission. How do they do their work? We used to think that <clears throat> some fairly simple techniques, having lots of patrol officers drive around the city looking for trouble, uh, arresting offenders, that those techniques in and of themselves would be sufficient to keep communities safe. We now know that there are serious limits to the effectiveness of preventive patrol and of the ability of police to simply control crime through the power of arrest. And so the police need a great deal uh, of additional tools and alternatives and options in order to be effective. Okay. Discretion. Uh, there was oftentimes uh, this notion that police were just law enforcement officers. <clears throat> they simply uh, investigated uh, violations of the law, and if they had probable cause to believe somebody had broken the law, they would then enforce that law. We didn't always realize that, in fact, police officers have a good deal of discretion in how they use their time, what kinds of problems they uh, actively investigate, and even when they do have somebody uh, detained for a violation of the law, uh, they don't always make an arrest. They don't always charge. In fact, I would venture to guess most of us, at least on one occasion in our time, have at least been stopped by a police officer and let go with a warning instead of a citation. That's the exercise of police discretion. And so in reality, police officers are not simply robotic enforcers of the law, but they exercise a great deal of discretion, and that's exercised throughout the chain of command, right at the street level, all the way up to the policies and strategies decided upon at the, po at the senior levels. The accountability of the police. How do we make sure they're doing what they're doing? We sometimes think that's really clear and direct. As long as they're enforcing the law, they're doing everything they're supposed to. Uh, the accountability is really a bit ambiguous. Not entirely sure what we can really hold our police accountable for achieving and what, what's unreasonable to hold them accountable for doing. Lots of different uh, uh, debates and arguments about what any police officer ought to be doing at any particular time. Well, always enforcing the law, doing something else. How do we control police departments? What's the most effective way to do that? Uh, many of us believe that police, sort of like the military, are under this very tight, strict control. We imagine that there is a supervisor looking out over every police officer at all times of his or her shift. That is far from true. In many cases, a police off patrol officer might not see a supervisor more than once or twice in an eight-hour shift. It is primarily independent police officers out there operating under rules and guidelines, to be sure but each of them making independent judgments about how best to use their time and what needs their attention. And so uh, we used to think that the best police organization was a very, very rigid, hierarchical, top-down, orders coming from on high, working their way down the chain of command, directing the officers what to do, uh, because we're borrowing from the military model of how policing ought to be done. 
It really is police organizations need to be much more flexible in, in order to be uh, effective. And lastly, the kinds of people that we think we need to become police officers. There was a time when the most important quality we were looking for in a candidate was they were obedient. They followed the rules. We told them what to do, and by God, they did it. Increasingly, we've come to understand effective police officers must be adaptive. They must be able to make independent decisions and exercise that discretion wisely. So this problem-oriented approach to policing is really built on this is a lot of information. This is a lot of uh, material to, to contemplate. But it was designed to try to reconcile this gap, the significant gap that, between the image and the reality of policing. Again, we used to think that police simply were the front end of the criminal justice system. Make an arrest, take the case to court, prosecutor would file the charges, go to court, there'd be a trial, defendant would be convicted or acquitted, if convicted would go to jail, serve a full term, and never sin again. That was sort of the ideal model of how this worked. We got a little more complicated, and this is, uh, you need not even be able to read this just to get the sense that, and those of you who work in the system know, it is a lot more complicated. But this, uh, even this graph doesn't really do justice. You see at the very beginning of it, the thickest line is one called crime. And if we imagine that's all the police do, is deal with crime, we would misunderstand the police function. We know that only about 15% of what the police have to deal with is what we understand to be crime. 85% of police work is really non-criminal. And so in reality, that line ought to run all the way to the ceiling and all the way to the floor to accurately capture the volume of what the police are doing. And if you do that, you then see the rest of the criminal justice system, in comparison, has got very little capacity to handle all of the business of police. It barely can handle, and many communities can barely handle the cases the police send over to them, let alone what the police theoretically could send over. So the criminal justice system is not going to be the solution to all of the matters that we ask our police to deal with. In some cases, the criminal justice system is not, is not equipped to deal with those kinds of problems. Problems in which defendants are mentally ill, problems in which defendants are addicted to drugs and alcohol, uh, which comprises a good portion of, many, of offenders. Criminal justice system is not adequately equipped to deal with that. And it doesn't operate well under high volume. A good criminal justice system is dealing with relatively few cases, giving them careful time and attention, and it doesn't operate well as an assembly line with, that's overburdened. And so if that's the case, we need to rethink how the police fit within other systems. Yes, they need to have a relationship with the criminal justice system, but they also need to have connections and relationships and working relationships in many other systems, in child protection, in dispute resolution, in mental health systems, with community organizations, with drug and alcohol treatment systems, and so forth. On and on. Juvenile justice, nuisance abatement, civil regulation, and so forth. The police are increasingly learning to connect with these other systems in order to handle all of their business. And it's incumbent on those of us at senior levels in police administration, but also in city government and in the government at large, to make sure that the police, that these systems, are accessible to the police. And one of the major issues across the country, and acute here in Milwaukee as well, is the relative inaccessibility of the mental health system to the police today. Twenty-some years ago, thirty-some years ago, when I worked as a police officer, in Madison, it was, nearly, it was nearly perfect. We had a model ability for a police officer. If I took into custody a mentally ill person, I could get a mental health professional out into the field any time, day or night, to help me deal with that person. And there would be space for it in an institution, if necessary, or in, uh, in the mental health system immediately. That's no longer the case. Uh, Madison police officers in Madison, they've even shut down the entire mental health uh, hospital in Madison, and so an officer has to travel with a person up to Winnebago, I believe. Right. 
This is, uh, this is a major crisis and only one of the systems that is not adequately equipped in today's day and age to help the police achieve their mission. Now this is deliberately lots of information here on one slide about problem-oriented policing, but let me hit the, uh, the highlights here. Uh, this, again, <clears throat> you need not be able to read it, but as I said, police deal with much more than just criminal behavior. You know, if you, if you follow what the FBI says, the FBI would tell us that there are eight crimes that we need to pay attention to. This is the stuff that gets reported every twice a year in the newspapers. Is crime up or down? It, that's really only a discussion about eight types of crime. Murder, rape, robbery, burglary, larceny, auto theft, arson, and so forth. That's it. In fact, this list, and I've been keeping this list for a couple of decades now, I add a new problem. These are, this is a list of all of the problems that the police routinely are confronted with and asked to deal with. This list now runs to about 250 different problems. And only a few of them uh, are criminal in nature. It's a lot of thing, it's a lot of stuff that we ask our police to deal with. And so, uh, in the same way, uh, for any of you who might be familiar or in the, the mental health field in psychology or psychiatry, you know there are somewhere around 350 different mental diseases and disorders. And if you're going to be an effective psychiatrist or psychologist, you have to be at least familiar with the signs and symptoms and treatment of 350 different kinds of disorders. And if you're a medical physician, it's around 3,000 different disorders and ailments. You understand that the nature of those professions are really complex and, and competence demands proficiency in, in at least familiarity in all of those. Well, this is the, the universe of policing. This is what a good, uh, any police department uh, has to be capable of addressing all of these different kinds of problems. In the problem-oriented approach to policing, we really ask the police to shift from thinking just about handling one incident, one case, one uh, crime at a time, and in addition to doing that, to handling those incidents, to step back periodically and analyze and look for patterns, look for trends, look for similarities and commonalities between and among these different incidents. And not just to look at, uh, and not just to ask the questions of who did it, the, the basic questions of a criminal investigation. Who did it? What happened? Where did it happen? What time did it happen? But in the problem-oriented approach, the critical question to ask is why. Not why do, not the philosophical question, why do people do bad things to one another, but the more precise question, why is this particular type of problematic behavior continuing to occur at this place? Why is this bar such a tr problem bar? Why is it this apartment complex generates so many calls for service, for police service, and this other one nearby doesn't? Why are we dealing with this individual so often, either as a, an offender or as a victim? Why is this behavior continuing to occur? And it's that search for the answer to why that is, can lead to a more effective intervention to actually deal with the underlying conditions that are causing and driving these problems. We have come to understand, and Chief Lynn mentioned this last night, uh, that with respect to offenders, somewhere around 50% of all the crimes that occur are committed by only 10% of the offenders. It's a handful, a relative handful of people who are committing most of the problematic, the criminal behavior. It's incumbent on us to figure out who they are and why they're doing that. The same is true with locations. In this big city, I would estimate that 60% of all of the police calls for service occur at probably no more than 5% of the addresses in the city of Milwaukee. Police are not going everywhere, they're going some places over and over and over again. And it's likewise true with victimization. Somewhere around 40% of all the crime victimizations occur to only about 10% of the victims. It's heavily concentrated. And so we really invite, encourage the police to analyze these patterns to find out where is it happening, to whom and who is involved, 
in the search for a more effective intervention. We're encouraging, again, the police to, to look beyond just the criminal justice system or beyond just the power of uh, patrolling and arresting people, using the, the tool belt just as a metaphor. Uh, these alternatives might include issuing warnings, selective intensive enforcement for the high-rate offenders, Enforcing civil laws, the city attorney's office is as important to the Milwaukee police as is the Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office. Right. Uh, working with probation and parole to enforce conditions of release. Uh, using mediation and negotiation. Altering the physical environment. We increasingly come to understand that the physical environment in which people live and work and play and operate influences the behavior in that place. It's true that the design of the roadway will in influence how fast we drive on that roadway. The design of an apartment complex will influence how much drug dealing, illegal drug dealing, might occur at that apartment complex. Designs of neighborhoods, designs of uh, places, and even the designs of products. The design of this cell phone that we all carry influences how likely it is to be stolen. And we're coming to understand that increasingly. We sometimes need the police to press for new laws to c control the conditions that create crime problems. A good example, a problem here in Milwaukee, is theft of scrap metal. It's a massive problem. Some years ago, this was a problem up in Eau Claire as well. Eau Claire police analyzed the problem, realized that the real issue was lax regulation of the scrap metal yards that were buying the stolen metal. And so they lobbied the state legislature to change the law to impose tighter restrictions on scrap metal dealers that would reduce the problem of scrap metal theft far better than any criminal law enforcement could do. <clears throat> Sometimes police are just conveying information. Sometimes they're uh, reinforcing informal social control. Sometimes they're coordinating and referring matters to other agencies. Sometimes they're mobilizing the community directly. And sometimes they're focusing directly on high-rate offenders. These are all tools over and above the traditional tools of policing. And we know from uh, crime prevention research there are yet many more. And so we want to uh, make sure the police are aware of all of these. <clears throat> and as I've said repeatedly, that the police need help Right? So they needed the help of the scrap metal dealers in Milwaukee to cooperate in reducing metal theft. And so we were, the police are increasingly learning to shift and share responsibility for the control of crime and disorder problems. But oftentimes when the police analyze these problems and they say to themselves, they conclude, you know, if only so-and-so would start doing something or stop doing something, we wouldn't have such a problem here. And when police come to that insight, Say, you know, if only this thing was designed differently, if only the, uh, the landlord would behave in a different way, if only the tavern owner would do this, if only the, the owner of the car would stop leaving the keys in the car when it's running in the winter time, right? If only, and then it, uh, uh, the police have to think about, well, how are we going to make that happen? Because obviously, those, if those entities, those people and organizations were inclined to do that, they probably already would have been doing it. <clears throat> they may not know, so it may be as simple as the police simply encouraging it, asking people to, to change their behavior, right? doing public education campaigns, right? engaging existing services, right? advocating for new services. We, got, we ought to create a new something in the city, we ought to have better mental health treatment services and so forth, getting a bit more confrontational, maybe taking the uh, a little bit of public shaming, hey, this uh, worst, worst apartment complex in the city. That's not, an, uh, that's not a story you want to see about your apartment complex in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Uh, sometimes withdrawing police service. You know, Milwaukee police uh, some years ago analyzed all the time they were spending responding to intrusion alarms in the city. And like most other police departments, realized that close to 98% of all of the alarms that they responded to were false. There was no burglar trying to break into the house. It was the weather, it was somebody uh, accidentally hit the wrong code button, uh, it was just a defect in the wiring and so forth. 
And so the Milwaukee police chief at the time, uh, under her authority, said, "We're not. We, th it, this is unproductive use of police time. We are not going to be the first responders to those. We're going to push that responsibility onto the alarm companies so that they improve the training and the caliber of the equipment they're selling. And that has reduced significantly the drain of resources, the waste of resources of Milwaukee police time. Right. Sometimes uh, police have to charge services. You're entitled to a certain amount of service, police service for your tax money, but not unlimited. Uh, and so now you're going to have to pay extra. Sometimes they're passing new legislation, as with the scrap metal dealerships, and sometimes they're filing civil actions against entities uh, like nuisance abatement actions against problem properties. So as the resistance to the request increases, sometimes the coercion that's needed or the pressure to get this change made has to increase, but so too does the quantum of evidence uh, the police have to have to justify this and the amount of resources necessary to pull that off. What do we mean by success? Ideally, we could eliminate a problem altogether, never to occur again. You would think that, might think that never happens, but in fact it can. We do have some success stories in which problems that used to be almost epidemic no longer exist at all. That isn't usually the case. Sometimes we're just content to reduce the volume. We don't have to go there as often. Uh, people are not hurt as much. Classic example are seat belts. 1965, seat belts were mandated in all cars. Seat belts do not prevent car crashes. They only keep people alive when the crash occurs. But that's better than fatalities. Right? Sometimes the best we can do is to shift the responsibility to, the, to those who are in a better position to address it, as was the case with the alarm example. And sometimes all we're doing is developing a more humane, a more fair response. When Wisconsin switched to a medical model for dealing with mentally ill people and intoxicated people in about 1974, what's known as Chapter 51, that has not eradicated alcoholism and mental illness in Wisconsin, but it has led to a more humane way of dealing with the people who were suffering from that. Instead of having them sit in a county jail without any treatment, without any help, they're increasingly going to medical facilities. And so police use a problem-solving process, the most commonly known one in the police field called the SARA model, scanning, looking for problems, analyzing them to understand why they're occurring, developing new alternative responses, implementing them, and then asking the question, how well did that work? And going back to the drawing board if it didn't work too well. And all of this is really intended to, if we can collectively get all police agencies doing this kind of work, we can improve the entire profession of policing. In the same way that <clears throat> the field of medicine and the field of law have been greatly enhanced <clears throat> by the willingness of doctors and lawyers to write down what they did, what happened in that case, what was the outcome, and to publish that <clears throat> in the Journal of New, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of the American Medical Association, and then for other doctors to read that and to experiment and continue. That's the way professions advance. The police have not had that for, for much of their history, and we are now trying to build that. And this, this Center for Problem-Oriented Policing that I direct which has been around for about two decades now. All of this information we collect and we put on this publicly accessible website, anybody can look at it, at popcenter.org. <clears throat> so there is a, a long history of interest and engagement with this concept here in Milwaukee. It was developed originally up in Madison at the Wisconsin Law School back in the late 70s, but the Milwaukee police, and this is just my own personal history with the Milwaukee police. I've been here many times over the years, the department is engaged in this approach, but as with any police department, any community, there remains room for improvement and enhancement of what they're doing. So there, uh, these are just some documents related to the current efforts and interest in the city uh, to explore the next steps in enhancing the Milwaukee police and the community's uh, application of this problem-oriented approach. And uh, Milwaukee police, to their, good, to their good credit, have done some exemplary work uh, uh, on various projects related to street prostitution, entire neighborhood level initiative to improve uh, safety in a whole neighborhood, 
uh, illegal activity out of uh, particular businesses and so forth. And they have documented several of these and contributed to the body of knowledge in the whole profession. And you can see many of these from both Milwaukee Police Department and other police departments on this website as well. There's a lot, uh, a lot of sort of moving parts to the full implementation of this concept, uh, and that's what much of the discussion going on this week uh, and hopefully in the foreseeable future will be about how to continue this approach and enhance it. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments? <laughs> Yes, sir, if you could uh, stand. Yeah, well, in um, question. Uh, the question, <clears throat> who's responsible for paying for police service? Uh, should it be a, a city have to pay for its own, or should counties and states, and I, I could add the federal government, uh, contribute? Well, in the United States, one of the, the most deeply cherished and held principles that we have with respect to police is we like local control. We have rejected the idea of a national police force since we created police. And so we like it as local as possible. That may not, it is not the most efficient model. It's not what most countries do, uh, but it is our style. And so we have in Wisconsin, we think over 600 police agencies. From one officer to the Milwaukee Police Department of over probably close to 3,000 personnel, civilian and sworn. Um, who should pay for it? In most cases, um, cities um, raise that money through property tax to pay for it. Counties run their own sheriff's departments and they typically feel no obligation to share any more money to support the municipal departments. But, and again I can't speak for how things would work in Milwaukee, when I was a police chief in, in South Florida, starting a new small, relatively small police department in the city of 60,000, I knew I couldn't afford all the toys and bells and whistles and sophisticated equipment and specialized services that a big department could offer. So I asked the sheriff, would you just provide those to me? Would you let me use your jail? Would you let me uh, use your communication system? Could I use your helicopters when I need them? Can I call in your uh, traffic homicide people? Everything that he was willing to offer, I was willing to accept. <laughs> and so that was not the sheriff giving me money or the county giving me money, but the county giving me services, sharing services. And I think there's a lot of merit in that kind of interagency sharing. At the state level, uh, states can contribute again, likewise with services. States uh, support a lot of the training academies and the training functions here. A lot of that is funded by traffic citation revenue, for better or worse. Um, uh, state provides uh, training and standards uh, monitoring. Uh, and increasingly now, uh, based on some recent legislation, the state is also willing to help police investigate, do investigations of officer-involved uh, critical incidents and fatalities. At the federal level, uh, it sort of varies from year to year. Um, of course, local police are helped by FBI, DEA, ATF, uh, but for the most part, uh, police, local police are left to do much of this themselves. Where the federal government kicks in is typically in the form of grant money, uh, and that waxes and wanes over the years. In the Clinton administration, it was a lot of money being poured out to all kinds of localities to help hire police officers, um, but there's no such thing as free money. So it, uh, it goes away eventually. Uh, is that fair? Uh, if you're talking about efficiencies, there, are, there is an approach that's been followed in a number of cities around the country to combine their cities and counties into one government, or to at least merge some agencies like the police department. Uh, Savannah, Georgia, where I previously lived, now has the, used to be the Savannah Police Department and the Chatham County Police Department and the Chatham County Sheriff's Office. There is now the Savannah Chatham Metropolitan Police Department. It is still two jurisdictions, a city and a county, but they decided one police department. In Indianapolis, they just merged the entire governments. It's now Indianapolis, Marion County, and so there's one police department for both. And that's a way, another way of getting the county residents essentially contributing their funding to help with much of the policing needs are in the inner cities. Yes, sir. 
Oh, so the question was what specific recommendations do I have for the Milwaukee Police Department? Uh, it isn't really m the purpose of my visit here. I'm not here to evaluate, to assess. I have given recommendations and advice and training at the Invitation Milwaukee Police Department over those many years when I was living here and working here. So I think uh, many Milwaukee police uh, personnel have heard about as much as they need to from me over the years. Uh, and not that it wasn't appreciated, but uh, they know what I'm, they know what I'm saying, they know the things that I've written. Uh, I'm not really in a position to be able to say at this point in time exactly what Milwaukee police ought to do. The fact that, that this event is occurring, that there are these organizations that have been created to uh, improve and to, and to get involved, the community taking a look at how policing is done, is an important and welcome development. Uh, because what the Milwaukee police ought to be doing ought to have the cooperation, the support of the community, the city government, uh, and, um, and the corporate community in Milwaukee. Yes, sir. Then I'll get back over here. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there's, uh, I don't do a lot of work with prisons, but there is some very interesting work. What, uh, there's some ba core ideas, one called situational crime prevention. It's a set of theoretical ideas about how physical design affects behavior that are really influencing how policing is done. I've been encouraging the corrections field to take a look at this and some new, in, so the design of a prison will influence the behavior of the inmates in the prison in lots of different ways for better and for worse. But the police working mainly outside the prisons are in a more challenging environment of trying to think about how do we redesign public space, how do we redesign products and so forth. There's a great body of knowledge about that and lots of this information available on our website. Police, relatively speaking, are just sort of at the beginning to explore all of those dimensions. So there's a lot to it, uh, but there's a lot of potential there for improving public safety. Let me get, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so the, uh, the question is why, if, if this seems like such a logical idea, as I, I'm glad it does seem that way, it does to me too, why aren't all communities and all police departments adopting it? Well, I will say many, many are, not just in the United States, but internationally. But if you think about this, um, the, the model I described where patrol was essentially sort of what I did as a patrol officer in the start a shift, you get, you get in your squad car, you go to your beat, you drive around, you look for trouble, you wait for the radio to tell you there's trouble over there. You drive over there, you deal with it, you write a report, and you go back and wait for the next call. I'm not saying that work is simple. It's oftentimes challenging. But over time, it becomes routine. And it's sort of a, a, just a process. We do a limited number of things, and we do them many times. And there is, in any occupation, there's some comfort in that. It's easier to do the same thing many times over in a sort of routine way than it is to confront a new problem every time. This problem-oriented approach is less simple. It involves more thinking, more creativity, more analysis, uh, which is a challenge in a fast-paced environment like policing, where there are things that need to be done right now, but there are also things that need, we need to slow down and take time. So integrating that fast-paced work, the need for the fast-paced work with the slower work and the more contemplative work is part of that challenge. But police officers that I've known over the years who have done this, uh, uh, or tried this approach, uh, it does make sense to them too. So it's just a matter, and I think the extent to which a whole community, this is really an important point, I think any community gets the policing that it wants and gets the policing it demands. And so you've got to say in this, if this makes sense to you, then whatever way in which you influence how policing is done in the city, you say, hey, we want that. We want that. Yes, sir. So the question is, why, why is Cincinnati held up as such a model? Uh, well, I do know it's, it's sort of dumb luck in that when Cincinnati, uh, the community filed lawsuits against Cincinnati police, mainly concerned about a, a pattern of shootings and uh, fatalities, mainly of young African-American men at the hands of police. Uh, so it led to federal involvement, a uh, lawsuit filed against the city, uh, an agreement uh, that the, the city was compelled to, to say, you've got to clean up your act, you've got to improve the practices in the police department. It just so happened 
that uh, they reached out to a colleague of mine who was at the University of Cincinnati, who was one of the main developers of the problem-oriented policing approach, and he said, well, what I know, the best way to police is this. Why don't we write that into the agreement? And so it was the first time it was done. He said, let's make the, the, what we want the city of Cincinnati to agree to is to embrace problem-oriented policing. Now, not many people really knew what that was, but that was in the agreement, so they had to do it. And then they brought in some competent expert people to train the Cincinnati police. And grudgingly, the Cincinnati police command staff of, you know, they didn't like being sued and being told what to do, understandably, but they eventually concluded, uh, starting with the chief, this is really not a bad idea. It really addresses a lot of the frustrations we've had as police as well. And so they, uh, instead of fighting it, they embraced it. And uh, the community, ultimately, I think the key takeaway from Cincinnati, and I've talked to the, the activists who, who were very critical, have essentially said it was, it's not enough for the police to stop doing harmful things in our communities. We want them really to come in and do helpful things. And when they, poli police can come in, it's, yes, we don't want you unnecessarily shooting our young men, but we want, we want safe communities. So if your officers can come in and work with us and help us make this a safer neighborhood, that's really what we're looking for. And if you can do that without excessive use of force and excessive use of the criminal justice system locking up so many people, all the better. Now, it doesn't mean Cincinnati is, uh, is nirvana. <laughs> they got their problems. Uh, and their practice of problem-oriented policing waxes and wanes over police administrations too. But to this day, the activists who filed suit say, in the in mainly African-American communities, this is better. And the police are saying this is better. Yes. Okay, so the question was, what is the most important attribute or characteristic for a police officer to have? Um, so I had up on the, on the screen this, this one word, adaptive. And uh, I'd say that's probably it. Some, some measure, some degree of adaptability. So uh, certainly an ability to follow rules and regulations and orders and to understand what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do, but beyond that, the real key is to understand that it, the world of policing is not always clear cut. It's not always black and white. It's not always absolute right and wrong. It's not always perfectly evident what one ought to be doing. And so the ability to, to adapt to the circumstances and to make good judgments about what is the most what is the wisest, the most effective, the most fair thing that I could be doing right now? Uh, and to tolerate that, and to tolerate uh, some ambiguity in, in the world, uh, not to get excessively frustrated by the fact that police don't control everything. You lock up an offender, you don't control whether they get convicted, you don't control how long they spend in jail. Uh, you don't control all of that and to learn how to adapt. I think we got time for one more. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, when I worked in New York, it was at about the, not, not quite 2,400, but we did top 2,000. Uh, and it was at the same time that we were implementing and developing th this problem-solving approach. Um, it's hard to say. The reductions in New York City, or the increase, is largely attributable to the crack cocaine market. The emergence of that in the mid-1980s and all the violence that spun off out of that in creating and establishing and defending and enforcing dr illegal drug markets was where the, the increase came from. No mistake about that. To some extent, as the crack cocaine epidemic kind of faded with so many people having died and suffered from it, and then eventually people saying, this stuff just is, it, it's poison, not so good. Uh, that it began to abate, and to some extent, the homicides have just reverted to a, a normal level, but they've gone even farther. And so I think it is, you know, there were a lot of weaknesses in the way in which we were policing in New York at that time, and the, the greater use of data, you may have heard of the ComStat system, or reliance on real-time data to identify where are, the, where are the problem locations, who are the problem people, to target, to focus police attention on those places is part of, and a large part of the explanation for the success in New York. I think that's all the time we have. I thank you for your time.
MCM Production.